Congruence. This is episode 29 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Thanks, Zaki. Uh, we're glad to be back, and uh, we are uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation from last time, which is actually a first for us. Um, we, I think, teased a little bit, uh, teased it a little bit on the last episode that we were going to kind of do a, uh, a, a two-parter, uh, a sequel, if you will, to uh, in, in, in Zaki speak. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thematic sequel. There you go. A thematic <laughs> sequel, sequel uh, or is it a reboot or a re? Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah. A reimagining. Recon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we want to. No, but in all serious, seriousness, we wanted to continue the conversation from last time, which was uh, talking about uh, some of the uh, uh, mental health issues that uh, that uh, that the Muslim community in America, specifically, uh, sort of deal with and grapple with and. Uh, we thought we'd have a different perspective on this show, and in that vein, uh, Zaki, who do we have on today? Yeah, so so we had a fantastic conversation with, with Sabine Sheikh last time, and we're very honored to be joined today by Micah Anderson. And just to give a little bit of background, uh, Micah was born in Connecticut. He spent several of his teen years in and out of psychiatric wards, drug rehab centers, and group homes. After years involved in 12-step fellowship, followed by extensive travel overseas, searching for spir- spiritual path, he began a personal meditation practice in the early 1990s. Uh, since then, he has taught retreats and led trainings on mindfulness and emotional literacy in five countries and leads a weekly meditation group in the Bay Area. He's also the wellness coordinator at Talif Collective, which, of course, we've talked about on this program many a time. Uh, it, but for those of you who don't know, it's a Fremont, California organization that provides an alternative social and sacred space for Muslim converts and seekers. Micah pulls from a wide variety of lived experiences, including struggles as an at-risk youth, years involved with straight-edge punk rock and hip-hop, living overseas for six years, as well as his ongoing practice of martial arts. Micah currently lives in Oakland, California, with his wife and two children, and we are very honored to have him with us. So, Micah, thank you so much for coming on our show. Wonderful to be here. I feel, feel honored. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So, Micah, just uh, we covered this just now in the bio, and I would love if you could tell our listeners about uh, what – what what's involved in uh, the the meditation sessions that that you teach? How does that work? What what's uh, what's involved in that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So you know, I I, um, I teach a style of meditation and kind of uh, meditative interventions, actually called mindfulness um, meditation, which is a it's a style of meditation that originally started. Um, in Buddhist practices, but in the, in the eighties, um, it was kind of stripped of theology and started to be introduced into clinical settings, particularly, um, helping people work with chronic physical pain. Um, but then it was also found that it it was, uh, very, very helpful for, for mental health issues, uh, for reducing stress, um, for reducing impulsivity or reactivity in people, um, and just kind of giving people a better, um, kind of general outlook on life and ability to just engage the, the joys and struggles of uh, being a human, you know? So, um, it's, it's a, it's a technique that, that, you know, there's various techniques, um, but I've been studying them and practicing them for, for over two decades now with really teaching them in the last five years or so. And I, I think uh, Pervez and I would both be uh, very interested if you could maybe guide our listeners through uh, 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 maybe a, an abbreviated version. Yeah, I'd, I'd be totally happy to. Um, it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, I, I guess maybe a little disclaimer uh, ahead of time, um, wearing my little lawyer hat. If you're driving an automobile, do not yeah. try this. <laughs> or operating heavy machinery. Yeah, right? Right. Uh, I'll let you. I'll let you. Uh, d- uh, yeah, say the little um, caveats, uh, Micah. But uh, yeah, no, no. That's you know. I, I mean, for the sake of you know, if we do try a little practice meditation now, please. it would you, you know it would be uh, best to, to to definitely close the eyes and and try and just maybe sit in a chair, um, just with your kind of two feet on the floor and just maybe the back being supported with the spine relatively upright um 
I guess before before I get into it, I can just maybe just talk a little bit more, if that's okay. Um, just no, about please. Kind of kind of what mindfulness is and and what we can do in in a in a little practice meditation. Um, it's re- mindfulness is really just about bringing attention and awareness to what's arising in the moment. That's really the simplest way I could define it. It's it's learning how to kind of be with what is, um, whether that's pleasant, whether that's neutral or whether that's unpleasant. Um, and, and it's really learning how to engage anything that we, that we experience in our day-to-day life with a bit more, um, understanding, a bit more compassion and a bit more awareness. Um, you know, we, we live in really challenging times right now, you know, all this technology that's, you know, just kind of rapidly coming in, I, I feel from all sides, uh, on us. You know, while it has a lot of uh, wonderful benefits, I, I think there's never been a time where people have been more isolated from each other, um, who are interacting less and less with each other. Um, and there's a there's a great price to that, I think, in today's society, just uh, this kind of mindlessness or, or distraction. I think it's, you know, people people are often resonate more with the idea of just being distracted rather than being aware Right. I mean, when we when we encounter somebody who's kind of got this sense of awareness, it's almost like a really unique experience sometimes. Right. It leaves us kind of scratching our head. It's like, what was up with that guy or that woman? Like, it's interesting. Right. Um, So it's almost like something that we're not really used to being being present. So what mindfulness meditation formally does is it teaches us to use the body sensations in the body, particularly like, for example, the breath. Okay as a point of focus, almost like an anchor to keep the mind settled in the moment rather than allowing the mind necessarily to kind of float into the future um, and get lost in some likes or dislikes or fears or fantasies or whereas the other place it goes, it goes into the past, right? So it's would have, should have, could have, if only it had worked out this way or the other way. So what mindfulness does is it's really teaching us how to kind of be grounded within the moment. Um, and I've found it to really help me just be a better parent, for example, and just kind of be a better worker and, and a better student. Um, you know, all the different hats that I, I may wear in my life, it's kind of allowed me to engage all of those those different areas with more um, intention and more attention. So uh, you, you guys want to give it a shot or what? Let's do it. Absolutely. Cool. Mike, as cool. always. Okay, great. So maybe we'll do like a, just a, maybe like five minutes or four minutes. Does that sound something like that? Like perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so again, yeah, just kind of finding a chair, a comfortable chair to sit in, just allow your back to be relatively upright. You can lean it back into the seat if that's more comfortable for yourself. Comfort's really key. Um, it is good not to be slouching and, and it is best if you're, if you're, you know, can find a, a space where you won't be interrupted for the next few minutes. Um, and then finally, just letting the eyes close. Um, it is, you can meditate, of course, with your eyes open, but, uh, it, you know, it, it is a, there is a certain level of distraction that does come through the eyes. So I would just invite, invite people to just let their eyes close. And then maybe just starting out with some sounds that you're taking in, either of my voice, right, or if there's ambient sounds in the room, that you're that you're in because we're we're always used to hearing and we're always used to receiving sounds so it's an easy place for us to start just bringing attention right bringing some concentration into the moment just hearing the sound of my voice and then again noticing any other sounds that may be happening around you whether it's in another room or or outside of if you're in a house or an apartment building or something like that whatever you're noticing right just kind of notice what's what you're hearing and try to really not judge it, just kind of be with it, right? And then you may also want to just also bring some attention to just points of contact. So feeling the feet on the floor, just noticing what that sensation feels like. Noticing the support of the chair or the seat that you're sitting in, whatever that might be. Now bringing some attention just to where the body's touching something else, right? So the feet on the floor, maybe the way the hands that have fallen, um, 
whatever else that you're noticing about points of contact. And just, again, allowing ourselves just to just notice, just kind of curiously notice what is arising, what, what we're experiencing, what we're feeling. It's almost like we're dropping into the body. We're just sitting with that for a few minutes. So there's sounds going on. And then there's these points of contact. And what you may have already noticed is, is that there's, even though we're sitting perfectly still right now, there's a lot of movement happening. And it's the breath, right? The breath is just constantly kind of breathing itself. These waves of breath keep coming and coming and coming. So maybe I would invite you to just kind of rest some attention just on the breath too. Just kind of noticing what that feels like. Maybe in the tip of the nose. Like you can kind of feel the, the flow of air going in and out. Or maybe the, the belly just kind of rising and falling. Maybe the expansion and contraction of the rib cage or movement of the clothing with each breath. And just kind of resting our concentration on that. Just breathing in and breathing out. And if you're anything like me, your mind's probably already drifted off a bunch of times, right? <laughs> so just, if that happens, just gently bring it back. Just kind of bring it back to the moment. Bring it back to the breath. And this really is what mindfulness meditation is. It's this kind of imperfect, we're looking for the perfection in this imperfect state of just forgetting and remembering and forgetting and remembering. Just breathing in and breathing out. So another minute or two, and then we'll finish up. We're just kind of riding, right, these waves of experience, right? There's distraction. There's maybe physical sensations. There's emotions that could be rising. But we're kind of not following any of them down the rabbit hole, so to speak. We're just kind of noticing them and then going back to the breath. And that's where the non-judgment, that kind of kind the kindness, we're framing everything in kindness and, and kind of self-compassion for ourselves, right? Because we're not perfect. We're just breathing in and out. Yeah, good. And then when you feel ready, you can kind of let your eyes open up. Yeah, and then you guys just uh, just practiced a little bit of presence for a few minutes. <laughs> what was that like? It was enlightening. Okay. <laughs> Please teach me. I need to be enlightened. So help me. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think we we pay <laughs> enough attention to just the sensations that are going through our body. Just taking yeah. that moment to, you know, sort of. Yeah. It's like a heightened sense of awareness where you feel a tingle here or. Um, you know, soreness here. Yeah, you know what I mean. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it certainly does. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's kind of. I think I think like in a lot of time, it's like it's like with our hearing, right? Like if an air conditioner is on, unless we focus on it, we just tune it out. Yeah. So it, that's it's just. Like yeah, and and I think awareness. a lot of us are tuning out very important cues that the body and the mind and our emotions are giving us, right? Sure. So that's really kind of what mindfulness can help us with is kind of lower us into this state, right, of just being present. Um, so, so physical sensations, right? How many times have we been pushing ourselves so hard and then we realized that we forgot to eat that day and we weren't taking cues of, you know, it was already too late. We already had a headache and maybe, you know, it started uh, affecting our emotions in a particular way, in a negative way, right? right? So that would be a perfect example of just kind of really just learning how to follow, like you said, follow the, the subtle and maybe not so subtle cues of the body and cues of the mind. Um, emotional states is a really important area as well that mindfulness can help us engage in particularly negative or difficult emotional states that may arise, right? So we're able to kind of catch them and engage them maybe in a, in a more skillful way rather than them just kind of blowing out, right? And blowing up, which yeah. is what can happen to a lot of people. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, thank you, Michael, for that. And I, you know, just to kind of echo, uh, what Zucky just said, I, you know, I, I felt exactly the same way in terms of 
I remember um, sort of experiencing it or going through it for the first time, maybe what, a couple of months ago now, uh, Micah, and, and having you kind of lead us through yeah. a mindfulness uh, exercise. And then I had the fortune of attending a kind of a day long um, retreat or workshop, sorry, with you yeah. Um, yeah. leading that at Tetleaf. And again, that was, yeah, a lot of just, you know, doing these exercises time and time again. And, and that's been really just helpful because then I've been able to now incorporate it. I would, I would, I'd love to say daily, but maybe every other day or so to try to do it. And, uh, like you said, about 25, 30 minutes, which I think for our listeners, I think you had made a point of that, that uh, they they say that a good time is about 25 to 30 minutes if you can. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's kind of different opinions around that. I think, I think more importantly, you know, we're talking about dosage basically, right? So it's like, I think more importantly is that when someone's starting out with anything, right, it's, it's much better to, to do something regularly. And even if it's less time, right? So more bite-sized regular chunks. So if you could do three or four days a week, starting with 10 minutes a pop, that's, that's great. I mean, that's, that's substantial. I, you know, not saying that you would want to necessarily keep it at that. If, you know, if it was something that you're feeling that you're benefiting from, I, I usually encourage people who are coming to our classes to start small, but regular, and then slowly over each week kind of increase those dosages, right? So maybe increase a couple minutes per week so that after six months or so, you know, you're, you're kind of, then you're starting to kind of get up there into 25, 30 minutes, which there are some people, you know, so there are some opinions that say that that's kind of the 30 minute mark is after that is when it starts to kind of maybe get more difficult, but also get more um, insightful for some people. Mm, mm. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, so I, I'd love to sort of pick this conversation back up in light of kind of the work that you do. But before we maybe sort of delve into that, I'd love to sort of go back to talking about some of the things that Zucky mentioned in your bio. Uh, sure. Frankly, some of the things, some things that, I mean, having known you even now for a couple of years, I, I myself was not aware of, um, you know, talking a little bit about your background, um, sure. you know, in sort of didn't know you were born on the East Coast, for example, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your, you know, sort of your early to young adolescence and uh, what drove you uh, to your spiritual quests and where that took you. And I yeah. think that would be itself and it, just an enlightening conversation. Yeah, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to kind of thank you get into that a little bit. So, yeah, so uh, only child, uh, born in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, you know, raised in a in a relatively well-off family, you know, um, middle-class kind of, uh, Northeast democratic, you know, liberal stock. Um, so that was kind of the background I was raised in. Um, my father was a pastor, uh, and my mother was an ex nun. So there was even in the beginning, there was, um, wow. spiritual and religious kind of, uh, surroundings that I was raised in. Right. Um, and at the same time, um, two different, very different kind of, even though both falling under Christianity, yeah, quite different in terms of their approach and practice, right? So there was this idea that there was, even from the beginning, I think I'm starting to see now that there was a kind of a plurality, or if that's even a word, or there was this kind of plural kind of uh, surroundings that I was growing up in. Um, it wasn't just a monolithic approach to spirituality. Right. Um, so I, I think that that, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. Even within Christianity. Right? right. Um, you know, I think that there were different approaches. My mother's side was a big Italian family and they were, you know, old school Catholics. Um, and then my father's side was Protestant. So there were these kind of, you know, two different approaches to spirituality. Right. Um, that I think I kind of soaked in a little bit. Um, you no, know, and no, then, uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, right, just please. curious, just curious when, when you say ex nun, um, that means that, I mean, typically that means someone who, you know, doesn't wear the habit and, and sort of marries, but, but still is probably a believer. Is that, is that, yeah, is that you're she, in your so, mom's case? Yeah, exactly. So my mother left the convent. She met my father when she was in the convent and then left the convent basically to get married and have me. She decided that she no longer wanted to be, um, 
a nun anymore and and practicing in the monastic tradition which you know as a, within islam we don't really have a monastic tradition like that that would be comparable to that right um where they take vows of celibacy and and this kind of thing maybe so, somewhat in the sufi traditions but right. i think um generally you know we don't we don't kind of have a have something that would be similar to that in our tradition so Right. So yeah. I, so I, I hate to make a crude pop culture reference, but please. like a la, a la Sister Mary in Sound of Music, right? I mean, for, yeah, for those yeah, people. exactly, exactly. Okay. You know, the, exactly. That's exactly it, right? Okay. And and then, you know, interestingly, she she left that, so that had its own um, wake of um, trouble within the family and and judgment and you know so i think there's a my mother was uh she, she was a she kind of she was a, a slight a lightweight outcast uh you know subversive uh, into you know kind of very more progressive right um approaches and and uh, just to to everything politics and spirituality and, and outlook right and that really influenced me and it still does to this day um, so anyways, you know, growing up, uh, only child. And, and by the time I was 11 or 12, I had fallen in with some, some, some people in the neighborhood and, and then, you know, we were just kind of hanging out, starting to hang out with some older brothers of some friends and, and, you know, started smoking and, and drugs started kind of changing hands and we started getting our hands on alcohol and, um, I really took to it. Right. Um, it was I had a very addictive personality, you know, from the very beginning. It was like I could not. I didn't have a choice. Does that make sense? It was almost like I, I couldn't say no. Absolutely. You know, um, whether it was, you know, uh, genetics or or in my, you know, mental or just even peer pressure, whatever the circumstances were, I really felt uh, that there was this kind of oppressive nature to my drug and alcohol use. Um, and I couldn't shake it. Um, even if I wanted to, I couldn't. And, and of course that, you know, money starts getting tight. So you start selling drugs and yeah. So by the time I was, you know, 16 middle, middle teen years, I was, I was using daily and I was, uh, in a fair amount of trouble, you know, and it was on a trajectory, um, that wasn't, didn't have a good out, didn't have a good, you know, uh, ending. Um, and I think everyone kind of saw that even myself, you know, my parents put me into evaluation and, and psych wards. I was in one for 10 days at Yale New Haven. And, you know, it was kind of inconclusive i was you know there wasn't any specific disorders it was seen i had you know drug and alcohol dependency or substance abuse disorder which is what it would be called now i don't know if it was you know 25 years ago if that's the term that they used um and then finally was admitted into a 45-day inpatient uh, treatment facility um in connecticut which was a locked facility and it was uh, other adolescents who were in there um for those 45 days. And then after that, I lived in a group home for about a year. And throughout all this time, I really, um, I underwent a real transformation. I mean, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't completely sold on it when I first went into the, to the rehab. Of course, I wanted to get back out as soon as I could and get back to what I was doing. Right. But, but in that 45 days, it was a real transformation. And, and, and I was going, you know, every type of therapy there was, you know, I was doing group process and family therapy and individual therapy. I was going to AA meetings and NA meetings and, you know, which offer their own kind of spiritual um, framework, right. As, as, Christocentric as it is, it's still, it was still this, it was, it was kind of a doorway for me back into spirituality. I had kind of stopped going to church, you know, in my teen years, like a lot of teenagers do. They kind of, you know, they, they drift off and they're trying to find their own, their own, uh, 
own reality, right? That it's kind mm-hmm. of separate from from what the parents tell them to do, or you 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 know you grow up kind of you know experimenting a bit and 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 checking things out. Um, so I, I think coming back into AA, I really took to AA and NA, the twelve step programs, um, a lot. And there's you know the message of a very very um, monotheistic approach, right? This this idea that there was uh, a higher power and that um, the only way that we could kind of overcome our disease of addiction was to was to surrender to to that higher power, right? Um, so I was really really taken with that, and I, I started. Uh, I was going to meetings every day and I was I eventually started chairing meetings and I was doing speaking, uh, at high schools around Connecticut, uh, you know, about my story. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, got, got some, got some clean time under my belt. Does you know, Mike, I'm just through. curious. Yeah. Does, please, does, yeah. Does, does AA have sort of Christian roots? I, I never even bothered sort of thinking about that, but, uh, like sort of the uh, origin, you know, like the, I guess the, originator or founder of the AA step 12 step program where, where, where are its roots is it in Christianity yeah I mean it, it, its roots were definitely Christian kind of based it wasn't necessarily belief in Jesus but it was a it was a theistic right it was a theistic um, okay uh, approach so the 12 steps you know, does it, 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 they're based on, on having to believe in a higher power, right? And, and there's some flexibility for some, for people around like what a higher power could be, right? For some, it could be the group. It's a power greater than myself, right? So right. I could find, I could find that actually AA is a higher power, right? So, and, and there were some people who did that. I was fine with the concept of, um, of kind of a, a god, you know, or god, or being being my my main um, being higher, the higher power. power, right? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it originally was founded by two Christians, you know, um, who who I think there there were there were elements of monotheism definitely that kind of seeped its way into AA. Um, and for, you know, for some people that doesn't necessarily, they don't want that. Right. So that's, that's for some people, AA is not, you know, is, is not the, is not the best answer for them because of, because of um, maybe their struggles with religion or theism or whatever, but it's not a religion per se, but it right. does require that someone does, um, does believe in, in, in a higher power. Right. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah, so you, you were saying, you, sorry, and, and so you're, you're out there sort of, you know, I guess talking to groups, talking to high school students and sharing your experiences. Yeah, and, and really took to these 12, you know, these 12 steps and, and, and the 11th step, as you know, you kind of work your way through the steps, right? So it's each one, you know, the first one is like you're admitting your powerlessness over drugs or alcohol or addiction, right? And that your life was unmanageable. You believe in a power greater than yourself, um, turning your will and life over to God. Um, things like m- taking inventories of ourselves, uh, seeking maybe uh, amends or, or forgiveness from people or for people. And then the 11th step was so- seeking through prayer and meditation to improve uh, a conscious contact with God. So this, I really took to this 11th step because it was like prayer and meditation to improve a conscious contact with God. It's pretty deep, right? right? Um, so prayer and meditation. So I was like, what's this meditation thing? And I'm, I'm probably 20 at this point or 19 or something like that. Wow. And I, you know, and I had these other influences, right? I, I was reading autobiography of Malcolm X and I was listening to hip hop and I was into, you know, kind of straight edge punk rock at the time that was, you know, kind of, uh, straight edge was a punk rock offshoot that, um, didn't use drugs or alcohol. They were, they were kind of clean living, often vegetarian, very strict kind of ethical guidelines, right? So this was, I had all these support groups within these subcultures that I was pulling from, right? Um, and some of the straight edge movement, particularly they, a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a, a good part of, of the adherence to sh- this kind of straight edge philosophy and outlook started kind of, uh, 
infusing some of their teachings with uh, with spirituality, particularly Eastern spirituality. So there were like Hare Krishna uh, hardcore bands, right? Punk rock bands. And there were kind of people who were interested in Buddhism. And, and so I, I kind of fell under the wing of this, this, this style of straight edge. And, and this is in the mid late, very late eighties, early nineties, more, more particularly. Um, and was introduced, uh, through some friends in New Haven at the time, um, to, to Buddhist meditation practice, um, in both the Zen tradition and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And I started, I started meditating, uh, regularly at that point. And, uh, eventually moved to California and, and lived in Santa Cruz, which was, yeah, of course, a, you know, a melting pot for all that kind of stuff. So I, I just went, I went crazy in Santa Cruz. I loved it. And, and this is, you know, in the, kind of mid mid nineties and, and then went on a trip to Asia, um, with, with two very good friends, um, doing meditation retreats and practice. And it was, it was kind of there. I, I was introduced to, to, to Sufism. I started kind of reading, um, some, some Sufi poetry and, and different books about Sufism and the ego and, and, um, the mind and, and practices that these Sufis were doing kind of mystic practices. And this re I really took to this. There were some elements in within Buddhism that I just wasn't resonating with particularly. And I think it was really because even though I wasn't a, no longer consider myself a Christian, I think there was still some sort of burned out framework in there of monotheism. And I was really, I think I, the way that I've often put it is like I, I had this sense of gratitude, um, but there was nobody to kind of give it to. There was nobody to thank. Does that make sense? So I, I really had this yeah. real experience of like I was a I believed in the creator and I believed in, in one God, even though I was technically Buddhist or doing Buddhist practices. You know, right. Um, and it's not that Buddhism is necessarily against that per se. It more just doesn't doesn't address it does that make sense it doesn't it just doesn't it doesn't kind of go there and i respect that on a great level too because you know how difficult words can get (laughs) you know what i mean when we talk about (laughs) matters of of the mind and heart right it can it can often um confuse matters worse than they are right so i think that there's i I have a respect for that but at the same time there was a there's kind of a missing element there and and you know, one thing led to another, and and within within a couple of years, I was uh, self-identifying as a Muslim. I, I was living in New York at the time, and I I, uh, I started attending mosque, masjid there, um, down in Tribeca, and and it was a it was a really profound time. Um, at the same time, you know, I was a kind of like I said, I was starting to consider myself a Muslim. I was, uh, but I was alone. I didn't feel. Um, I didn't have like a, another group of converts around me. Right. I was kind of just, there wasn't an internet yet. Like it was, I was still kind of adrift slightly. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't think I really, even though I'd called myself a Muslim at that point, like I didn't know everything. I didn't probably even fast at that point. Like I didn't, un, I didn't know that you had to do that yet. Right. Um, mm. so, so it was like all these other influences, Malcolm X and, and specifically like hip hop at the time in the, in the, you know, the early nineties in, in New York was really influenced by, you know, Zulu nation and the five percenters movement. Right. And, um, you know, uh, these kind of, there were these quasi Islamic elements that were kind of infiltrating into the music and into my daily speech and into my address. And like, I started using a miswak and, um, <laughs> I wore a kufi, like when I, you know, these kind of things, like this is like in the early nineties, right. When, when, because that was like part of the style. So it's, it's, there were these, all these kind of influences and, and I don't discount the, the, the importance of that ever anymore. Right. The, oh, no, absolutely. The, yeah. The, I mean, one of my wish lists for the show has been to have, uh, you know, I, I've, I've actually reached out to a couple of people to sort of come on the show and talk about the um, the infusion of Islam into 90s hip hop yeah, and, yeah. and huh. really the origin, the, the origins of hip hop, sure, really, sure. you know. Uh, so, yeah, that's I, I, I completely uh, know where you're coming from. So, so did now we, I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, 
when you your travels overseas, uh, specific Muslim countries that you travel to? Well, yeah. So what the first trip we did was tw- was in nine, 1995. Okay. Actually, 20 years ago, we're, the, the, the three of us, my other two friends, were actually considering going on a 20-year anniversary trip, maybe the beginning of next year to kind of revisit some of these places. We're, <laughs> right. we're, yeah, we're still trying to hatch that plan. But, but we, were, uh, <laughs> we started in Thailand. We were in Thailand for a month, um, and then we went to Nepal, and then we were in India. And okay, I was in okay. India for maybe two and a half months. And that's, it was mostly in the north, right? So I spent a lot of time in, in Delhi, particularly the Nizamuddin district of, of Delhi. I spent quite a bit of time there. And it was all through, through the north. Um, and then went back on several other trips over the next five years, eventually landing in Indonesia. And I lived in Indonesia for about five years. Um, that was wow. as, as a Muslim practicing Muslim at that point, right? That, um, uh, that, that's later. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. certainly your travels through North India, I mean, you are being introduced to Islam by or via the Sufi tradition for yeah, sure, right? That's right. Visiting, yeah. Perhaps yeah. visiting shrines and yeah. it, that, that whole subculture in yeah. India. Uh, yes, right. yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and that's, and that's that, you know, I think the subculture element really took to me because right. I've, I've, I've had a history with subcultures, right? <laughs> that, that's right. Kind of right. thread, right? I've always been interested in like the fringes of culture, <laughs> the, the, the margins of culture, no, not, no, I, not the mainstream, like what's on the side, like what, who's, who's out Who's doing stuff that's a little bit different, that's a little bit off the grid, or you got to kind of search a little bit more. So I think, yeah, there was an element that I was kind of, I was uncovering something really kind of cool at the time. I was just like, and nobody I knew knew anything about this stuff. So it was just like, it was kind of me in these books, like wandering, whatever, these uh, medieval lanes in Nizamuddin finding, like you said, you know, different shrines and eventually going out to Rajasthan and, and to, to Ajmer. And you know, this is all particularly in the Chisti, um, order. Sufi of, order. Um, yeah. 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 Nizamuddin so, Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. yeah, yeah. So and, and you're really, right. I mean, really, even your exposure to Islam and Muslims is coming sort of by way of, I don't want to say the periphery, but certainly not Muslim majority countries. And I mean, other than Indonesia, but that's later, but I'm talking about these early experiences. Um, so I can definitely see you sort of resonating to that, right? That, that, that sort of what you're talking about. Um, so when you embrace Islam officially, or when you, I'm sorry, when you, when you begin to identify yourself as a Muslim, you, you said you're living on the East coast, you're in your probably what mid twenties. Yeah, I would say, right, it was whatever, 24, 25, like in there. Hmm. Okay, and then uh, do you ever, like, so when does the sort of formal shahada and, and, uh, uh, or does that come and and, and sort of formal learning take place? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was interesting, like, there was... There's a period of time. I mean, I, I, I finally embraced Islam. The, the, the time that I consider my embrace, like my formal embrace of Islam was when I, I, I became kind of, I started practicing and I started praying five times a day. This was in New York. And I, I, I consider that like my kind of formal entry into the into Islam, although I self-identified as a Muslim for years before that. Right? right. But um, it was, it was in New York where it was kind of like, I, I started getting it. I was like, I found a community who I was kind of visiting with on a weekly basis and praying with. And I started to kind of see like, Oh, I get it now. Like that's what was missing. Like there were these missing elements that I had before. Right. right? Um, from my practice that I just didn't, didn't know about. Right. I didn't know. And then I, I you know, started kind of, I fell down that rabbit hole of whatever, of uh, learning some Arabic and learning how to, you know, pray properly and, and the five pillars and, you know, more kind of formal embrace of of, um, of normative Islamic practices. But at the same time was very much still influenced by the, the kind of more spiritual mystic traditions within the context of, of normative Islamic practice. OK. And so that happens in New York then. Yes. Yes, it did. And then, and then, you know, I, I, and I was bouncing around at that point. I lived in New York for a year, year and a half. Uh-huh. Um, I probably came back to California. I was in Thailand for a period of time. I 
kind of bounced off. I was, I was a nomad. I was really living kind of a nomadic existence, right? Um, at that point. And then, yeah, I, I ended up uh, finally kind of settling in Indonesia for five years. This is, you know, whatever, 10 years later, right? Um, after that, that period in New York, um, in, in the mid, this was like 2005 or something like that. I think I finally left the States with a one-way ticket, really with not an intention to come back. I was, wow. I wanted to live overseas. Yeah. Um, but things so, changed. So what, do, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what does bring you back? Yeah. And, and, and then you're in California. <laughs> yeah. I, I ended up, you know, this is kind of, this is where Tet Leaf kind of enters the narrative. Okay. So, so Please. Sam, uh, Cannon and myself, I, I, I had known his brother for, probably 10 years before I met Osama or, or was really kind of friends, close friends with Osama. Um, we had performed a lot of music together and recorded together for years. Um, and then uh, one, on one of my trips to Thailand, I brought back, I was, I brought back um, Ode, you know, aloes wood to burn. Um, and I, I, I don't know how, I don't know where it was, or I met Osama someplace and, he was he was into the same thing. We had kind of both gotten into this, and I think either he bought all the oud that I had, or found somebody to buy it, and we sold it all, and we're like, oh, cool, like we can let's start selling oud. So we started selling oud, and and you know our relationship started kind of picking up. We 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 remained close, even though I was living in, in Indonesia. And he came out on a trip one time to Singapore, and you know was talking about Tet Leaf and how they just got in this new space and. And, um, we, we had dinner one night and he was like, you know, I, I think at that point we, I had had my first child with my wife in Indonesia and, and, and we were living in Jakarta and it's a massive city. I mean, it's literally bursting at the seams, right? It's 30 million people. Um, and it's really being sadly kind of crushed by its own weight. You know, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And anyone who's, who's traveled through developing countries, there's even wherever it may be in, you know, in Southeast Asia or even the Middle East knows what I'm talking about. Right. It's, oh, right. Um, right. Flooding infrastructure and, and, you know, um, just mosquito borne diseases and et cetera, et cetera. Right. The list goes on. And it was finally just like, I really felt like it wasn't, we both felt my wife and myself that we were just like, it's not fair to him, our son to kind of raise him here when we could, come back to the States. So I went back to school and Hassan was just like, come to Tetleaf. You can stay there. You start running the convert programming there. And we started kind of launching the, some training programs that we do, particularly the Moalif mentorship program per vis. Um, that's when that kind of hatched that, mm -hmm. that program hatched. Um, yeah. And then I, I ended up finishing my bachelor's degree at that point, uh, at Goddard college in Vermont. It was kind of a distance program, um, distance education program. Program and then right back to into the master's program at uh, Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, which is now Sophia University in Palo Alto. Um, and I'm just finishing my third year, uh, inshallah, of that. Awesome. Um, yeah, you know, and and our listeners, uh, uh, Micah, have already sort of heard the story of Talif. Cool. Uh, we've had Osama on the show. Uh, right. In fact, Osama, when we had Osama on the show, he, he even talked about rudimentary. Um, and uh, just for the sake of our listeners, uh, Micah is actually co-founder of, of uh, that enterprise, uh, which is, um, what was the tagline? Um, don't hate fumigate, I think That's is what right. we were talking about. Right. Don't hate fumigate. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So, so yeah, so we, we've certainly touched on it. Um, so now your formal engagement with Talif begins, and, and, and I think you, you sort of mentioned, um, you, you know, you were at, you kind of came in, took lead on the convert care, um, and then now the Mualif Mentorship Program, which we haven't really, really talked about, but uh, maybe if you do want to talk a little bit about that, I think that, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a training program um, to basically teach and build with others to try, the, to, try to teach what Tetleaf does, which is provide uh, provide support and, and pastoral care um, and and emotional care um, to converts and and to more than converts, but but just kind of the, again going to the kind of the disenfranchised segments of the of the Muslim 
population in the Muslim experience, right? Um, so just it's often the people who they may just maybe they're revisiting their faith and they're coming from immigrant backgrounds and they've kind of dropped off for a while and they're not feeling like they're ready to kind of necessarily engage a masjid or maybe they are engaging masjids but they're just looking for for a, a different kind of community so so tet leaf this Malaf mentorship program is is basically trying to kind of empower people to to be able to go and provide their own service to their own communities hmm. okay um, and and we we pull from um of course our own tradition and and um the the vast knowledge that we we have um, from the Islamic tradition, and and we infuse it with uh, kind of a mix of Western psychology and counseling skills, and mindfulness, and emotional awareness, and uh, just some some kind of facets that I think over tri- uh, trial and error period, of maybe even a lot more error in the early years, right? We we found that there were these missing elements from islamic pastoral care in the united states and they were you know how to sit with someone how to develop empathy for for the people who were serving right how to be able to um provide support in whatever way that that means um does that kind of is what i'm saying resonate with you guys is that yeah, well, in, in fact, I, I was hoping you might be able to sort of get into it a little bit more about what goes into the, the, the process. I mean, what's, what's your approach to counseling? Uh, you know, last time we had Sabine on, who I believe, yeah. I believe you know, and, you know, I mean, the, sure, the, sure. the, the need for having very difficult conversations, uh, uh, in in the Muslim community, some would say, especially in the Muslim community, is is definitely there. And so, in in that sense, you're doing something that uh, uh, you know not a lot of people are familiar with or don't talk about. So, I mean, what uh, what is your approach to this process? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, that's a wonderful question, and it's you know, it's a, it's kind of a moving target, right? Because I'm still in school and still kind of just getting involved in, in being supervised at practicum sites, which, uh, as a side note, Tetleaf is becoming one of the practicum sites. So we'll be having clinical supervision at Tetleaf starting uh, starting very soon. Um, that's that's just getting launched right now. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my approach is is what we would be called in, in, in the therapy world is kind of a client led approach, a, a humanist approach. Um, I believe that each human has the potential inside of them to become better people and to change and that we just kind of get sidetracked along the way. Right. So my approach is very much building on the strengths that people bring in to the room. Right. So I don't look for necessarily look for the, um, the pathologies or the, you know, trying quickly to diagnose people, but I'm really looking for strengths and how strengths, how building strengths can help people heal. Does that make sense? So, um, and it's humanist. I, I, you know, love existential conversations. And I think that that's a very important part of kind of my work in therapy with, my clients and and then of course you know most importantly possibly is the influence of mindfulness um on my own uh interventions you know um whether it's with myself as the therapist because if i'm unable to keep track of my own self while i'm sitting with someone then how am i going to best serve that person right so first and foremost the ability for me to be grounded the ability for me to be able to track my own triggers, track things like transference and track things, whatever may be arising in the moment, right? It's important for me to, I have to engage myself first. That's that kind of first intervention is with myself. And then secondly, using mindfulness as kind of a foundation, a launch pad for people to explore their their lives, their traumas, their memories, their experiences, right? Whatever it may be that they're bringing in and maybe seeking help with, whether it's simple communication skills between a married couple to maybe even, um, you know, complex trauma, 
right? Or PTSD or something like that. Um, both, both can be served uh, by mindfulness-based interventions, us being able to bring more attention to what we're doing in the moment. Does that make sense? So yeah, that would kind yeah. of be like the approach that I'm really bringing in um, personally to the work that I do, whether it's at Mind Body Awareness Project or it's at Tet Leaf Collective. It's a very similar, it's a very similar approach across the boards for both of them. Yeah, no, I, I think what you allude to is, you know, we've talked a lot about mindfulness, but that's not to give the impression, and I think you would agree that you know, you certainly offer this sort of more of a holistic approach to healing, as it were, right? I mean, because you see the interconnection um, between, if you will, uh, the mind, the body, and the soul, right? And so, because right. when you're talking about PTSD and you're talking about uh, other traumas, I mean, these have not only mental or psychological um uh, consequences, but they also can carry, you know, they, they also have an impact on people's behavior. So it's action. Sure. Right? Sure. Sure. Right. So, yeah. so certainly bringing that sort of holistic approach that arguably, you know, Islam, right. I mean, and I think you'd agree as well. I mean, we sort of look at the human as that sort of whole, right. Uh, and, and, and kind of sort of treat any kind of trauma in that, with that vein, with that view. Yeah, I, I I completely agree, and I think like, like that approach is been one of the missing elements that our program, for example, like the Mualaf Mentorship Program, has been able to kind of infuse into our what we're doing. Right, this idea that like we need a skill set large, being able to quote Quran and Hadith while we're sitting with. Clients, right, and and we're any imam who's in any inner city in the United States will tell you that, and they know that, right. So it was like we saw these people coming back from overseas who had studied for ten years, okay, in the desert or wherever they were, or even if they were in the city, right, right, and were many of them, and I've heard this from them. I'm not just making this up. Like, were unable, really felt like they were unable to trans what they heard into boots on the ground, this person sitting in front of me um, who's been sexually abused by her father. And I have no idea what to tell this person or what to do. You see what I'm saying? So, like, yeah. there was this missing element. There was this unholistic element to service work, which is still existent most places in the United States, if not worldwide. Right. But this, so, so I think like, that's what we're trying to kind of bring in this, like you said, you named it. It's a holistic view. It's the ability to look at the physical, the mental, the emotional and the spiritual. And, and if one's out of line, another one's probably going to be out of line. And if we can work on all four of those, that's really going to make a more integral human being and a more integral Muslim, right? Mm-hmm. For the, for the perspective of the service that we're doing to the Muslim community, for the Muslim community. You know, the perspective of psychology, I'll finish. The perspective of psychology is this transpersonal psychology. And that's actually the name of the school where I started. I was Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. The transpersonal really trying to kind of look at and trans, right? Trans person beyond whatever that means beyond the self or beyond our ego or beyond. Right. And I I think the the only way towards that is, is this fully integrated um, healing process, as you put it, Purvis, like the healing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And and it's funny. I think you almost teased it. And, and and just so you know, you know, like, like, like last time we were on the show with Sabine, in fact, I actually read an excerpt from the book and that's spiritual bypassing, which beautiful. Uh, thanks to yourself and Osama sort of turning me on to the book. I'm actually sort of finishing it up now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think exactly kind of what you're talking about, which is, you know, people who are trained experts in the sciences of Islamic studies or are trained scholars or imams, but or clergy, let's say, but aren't trained in pastoral care, right? There is that, not, I don't want to say tendency, but there's, there's the, uh, 
ability to easily sort of uh, try to solve problems or to give advice, uh, which would fall into that the or the notion of spiritual bypassing. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a major thing we teach at at the Moth Mentorship Program, right? It's about spiritual bypassing, which is, I guess, for the listeners just to define it. It's please. It's when spirituality is used to kind of circumvent real uh, needs, real emotional needs, real traumatic needs, real needs of a, of a person, right? So this idea that we're, you, we use, you can use religion and spirituality to bypass a whole lot that, that we need to actually be looking at. Does that make sense? So, so yeah. uh, I think people using religion to hide, people using their spirituality to just not have to deal with what's in front of them. Right. Just, uh, you know, the old, uh, you know, story about, again, a woman coming in to the imam who's being abused and he just tells her to be patient. In my estimation, that's probably not the best answer to be giving her. Right. Right. If she's being abused. Right. Hmm. Or, 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 or a person comes and says, look, I have an addiction problem or I, For sure. or, 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 or I'm a chronic, wh- whatever. Right. And they say, well, make vicar, read Quran. Right. <laughs> so. Exactly. Exactly. No, the person needs to be in a drug rehab. Right. And make vicar and read Quran. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not one and not the other. It's this right. idea that we're talking about integrating things and not using spirituality to bypass what needs to happen, but using spirituality to bolster and, and to, to, to help people heal. Right. And that's, I'm not saying it's an easy on a personal level. It's just like, even right now, as I'm saying it, I'm just like, wow, I kind of can't even do that. Right. It, you know what I mean? It's like, of course, this is a goal we're, we're shooting in that direction we we have that as our, um, as our intention, as our neo, we're going that this is what we want and this is the direction that we're, we're walking in. Right. And even if some days it feels like it's, you know, one step forward, two step backwards, we're still going in that direction, um, towards that. Wow. Well, that's, I mean, that's a a lot to take in, but I mean, it's also kind of a great place to leave off uh, this portion of the conversation. And, and obviously, uh, this is an open ended conversation because we definitely would like to have you back on again at some point and kind of pick up where we left off because, uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, these, these are conversations that sort of do need to happen within the Muslim community. Yeah, I, I agree. And as hard as those conversations are, and going to be, you know, there's always, uh, there's going to be people who are just kind of like, they're not ready to go there and they're not ready to hear this kind of stuff. And maybe even some of the listeners are just kind of like, I don't know about this. Right. Well, but, I mean, um, I, go ahead. No, I just feel like if, if we aren't doing it, then who's going to do it. Right. Sure. It's, right. We have the stage. So let's, let's, we're going to, we're going to bring, we're going to put the light on things that need to, to be the light to be put on. And, and yeah. that's not always a pleasant experience. You right. know what I mean? But it's a, an experience that's needed, right? No, I think there's, if, if you will, if you allow me to borrow sort of the expression, but like there's almost a sort of collective spiritual bypassing that takes place among Muslims especially, which is this idea that, well, oh, all this like stuff is like hokey, hokey pokey, like, you know, uh, Berkeley, uh, California, hippie yeah. uh, Islam, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our, our, you know, th- this isn't part of and, and, and that And that's unfortunate. That's really unfortunate because I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Yeah, and if they all just came to Berkeley, they'd probably love it anyway. So. <laughs> exactly. Here we are, three bunch of the three of us sitting in the Bay Area saying that. But yeah. <laughs> well, well, Micah, I mean, uh, people listening to this show uh, might want to reach out to you. Is there is there a way they can uh, get in touch with you? There sure is. Yeah, that's fine. It would. Um, I guess you could email me um, at wellness w e l l n e s s at tetleafcollective.org. And do, do we want to spell that just in case people... Yeah, T-A-L-E-E-F-C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-V-E dot O-R-G. Yeah, yeah uh, I'd terrific. love to hear from people, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, is there, for, is there a website or anywhere else online uh, that, that people can sort of find out more about you, more about the work that you do in addition to Tetleaf's 
uh, website, which yeah, is yeah, I mean, t- so, so, you know, we didn't even get, we didn't even, yeah, we, we didn't even talk about like MBA project. There's a whole other job that I work at. I teach oh. mindfulness to incarcerated youth in in juvenile halls uh, around the Bay Area. So that's, you know, if people can go on to the MBA project, uh, that, I think it's mbaproject.org, um, or if you just Google like uh, MBA, Mind Body Awareness uh, Project, that's a wonderful organization that's doing, you know, um, very similar work to what, uh, you know, Tet Leaf does. It's just with, a, with another disenfranchised population, right? At-risk youth or incarcerated youth um go into juvenile halls we run groups we teach them meditation techniques to kind of help with impulse regulation and anger management and you know uh emotional intelligence it's wonderful wonderful work i mean it's uh, incredibly challenging but but really really rewarding and it's it's been it's such an important like part of my own spiritual path and practice is just going in and sitting and, and holding circle with these youth um, and sharing experience and stories. And so that would be, yeah, one, one other place that people can kind of just see um, a, a wonderful organization and the work that they're doing. You know, yeah, and I think we were remiss not to talk about that, but I really do appreciate you sort of, do, you know, like, like you mentioning that. And, and as Zucky said, you know, we'd love to sort of have you back on uh, and, and, you know, we can maybe explore that conversation some more. Um, but, uh, no, thank you so much, Micah, for the time and for uh, joining us on the episode. Thank you, guys. And I'm just really happy you asked me to come. I'm, like I said, it's, a, it's an honor to just be able to, you know, talk about this stuff and hopefully bring some some more attention attention to it i'd love to hear from people and and i'd love to be be back and have another conversation yeah and then you know in in that vein um you know do 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 reach out to us on the show as well with any questions or comments or suggestions you have um you know diffuse congruence at gmail.com uh visit us on our facebook page facebook.com slash diffuse congruence we'd love to hear from you um i know we've even two episodes in we've I don't even want to say scratch the surface, right? Because I, I think we, even that is being generous. I mean, we're really just sort of beginning to talk about these issues. Um, uh, but uh, we hope that you've enjoyed uh, the conversations we have had these last two episodes. Um, Zaki, I don't know if you wanted to had any additional thoughts that you wanted to. Well, uh, just, I just want to echo what you said. Absolutely, the, the, this is this is a, a very rich vein of thought that we absolutely do want to come back to. So uh, that's that's something that people can absolutely look forward to us uh, uh, doing in in the in the not too distant future. Wonderful. That's, that's right. Uh, well, thanks for listening, everyone, and uh, do 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 join us in a um, in what uh, hopefully in, two weeks. We'll we'll in, have. In, in a few short weeks. <laughs> there you go, Zaki. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, on behalf of uh, my colleague, Professor Ahmed, and on behalf of our guest, Micah Anderson, my name is Zaki Hassan. This is Diffuse Congruence, and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye.